another day another For day. the breath I breathe to the trees back to me Can't you see? I'm living life in harmony Got the sun shining down on me Alrighty, Bismillah, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, everyone. Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me uh, clearly, inshallah? Let me know in the chat. Jazakum Allah khair. Mashallah to the over 200 and rushing higher of you that I see in the Zoom, the chat. And of course, those of you who are joining us on YouTube and around the globe. Jazakum Allah khair for, for confirming that you guys can hear me and see me. Alhamdulillah. That is amazing to hear. Welcome to our fourth season of Ramadan 360 with Al Maghrib Institute. It is such an honor to be joined uh, with in such great company once again. Just out of curiosity, because uh, I know, mashallah, there's so many of you here already, and there's so many who are, who are continuing to join us. But uh, who has re attended Ramadan 360 in the last year, like in 2020? Three. Were you guys here in Ramadan 360 for that month? I see Sayyid said, oh, so you said the no. That's okay. I appreciate the honesty. Aya said you did. Dana said, nope. First time. Amazing. Welcome, Dana. Suri, of course. Well, nice to see you. Walaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Hope you and the family are well. Shefa, you did. Nemo, of course, we remember you, Nemo. Dania, lovely to hear. Maisha, first time, mashallah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Who has attended? This is our fourth year. So who's attended more than one year? Uh, of Ramadan 360. And out of curious, is there anyone who's attended all four? Janet, welcome, uh, Jazakallah for joining us for the first time, mashallah. Akil, you joined for more than two. Uh, Hussein, first time, welcome, welcome. Actually, while you guys are trickling in, if you can do me a favor, the way that you see my name displayed, if you can just copy cat, cat that and rename yourself, especially the first timers, what we do whenever we do an Amagar virtual experience, which this is, is that we re rename ourselves on Zoom and add our locations because mashallah, we have a very international organ, uh, sorry, group of students. So we like to see everyone's kind of uh, location reflected next to their name. So I'm coming in from Toronto. So I've got Hafsa from Toronto, but please do. Some of you already have Mashallah Mona from California and others, but do make those shifts inshallah and rename yourselves there. Um, and also a reminder, please also uh, take a second. I know I had it, I had it disabled before, but I'm going to enable it uh, to turn on your cameras because one of the really cool things about this experience is that we get a chance to hear from uh, and to see all of you guys, see your name, see your faces. And and connect with you guys uh, in a really beautiful way virtually. So just take a second to get settled into your seats, turn on your cameras. This is expected to be a really big crowd. So we might at some point have to uh, shift or ch change the, the ability to turn on cameras. But for now, we want to see everybody in their glory and get a chance to uh, connect with you all. Alhamdulillah. So I'm just going to take a second to get settled here. There's a ton of reminders. Ramadan 360, of course, is our kind of flagship program in Ramadan that we like to give back to the community with our beautiful instructors here at Al Maghrib Institute and kind of put together uh, some of the great work that we've done throughout the year and just give you guys some, some access to everything for free. Alhamdulillah. So Jazakum Al for, for registering, especially if it's your first time. And please make sure you share with others. It's totally free. It's beneficial for the entire family. One person can, can register and everyone can, can kind of sign in and, and watch together, inshallah. And inshallah, it'll be a life-changing experience as well which by the way is part is our topic this year living by the book 30 life-changing quranic principles in 30 days and we're very excited to have you guys join us on that journey alhamdulillah now there's a lot of logistics and a lot of kind of like important things i'm mean, lovely to see mashallah a lot of brothers on screen for the first time look at the brothers mashallah uh, but sisters families i got siblings mashallah uh, is that the Leighton siblings? Mashallah, great to see you all coming in together. Feel free to, to pull anybody in your room. I know some people are still finishing up work. It's amazing to see you guys make the time. Maliha from Sweden, welcome Maliha uh, in the chat. And keep introducing yourselves, keep saying your salams as you're coming in. Now, I'm your host. My name is Hafsa. Uh, if you're involved in or if you've attended any of the other Amagar programs, then you have seen me uh, around before. But it's a pleasure to meet many of you for the first time and to connect with you here. Uh, and I'll see you'll see a lot more of me and other amazing hosts from the Amagar family uh, who you've grown to know and love. Alhamdulillah. And some new folks as well. Houston, Texas in the house, California, Calgary. I know there's a lot of probably Malaysia, Singapore. We have a very international group. So feel free to say your salams. Now, I'm going to run through as much as quickly as I can some important announcements. Uh, I apologize in advance, Sheikh Suleiman Hani, who is our speaker for today, is 
always so strictly on time, but I'm gonna have to steal some of his time just to make sure that we're all situated uh, for today's session. It's gonna be a one hour and 15 minutes or so session, maybe a little bit more than that. So just mark that in your calendars. We start every single day at 5 p.m. EST. We finish up around 6.15 p.m. EST. It's a two-part experience. So the first part is our Ramadan 360 talk with a, a, a new and amazing speaker that shifts every day within the Al Maghrib community and family. And the second part is our Quran Reflect, the daily Tadabur reflection sessions with Usada Tainia Zubair, where you guys actually get to interact more and you guys actually get to speak and, and be on the mic and connect with Usada and the rest of the community here, alhamdulillah. Um, that said, every year we're always honored to be partnered with some amazing organizations that make this uh, experience possible. And it's, it's even more special that they're charity organizations that do are, are doing some of the really difficult work on the ground to take care of the most vulnerable in our ummah. This year, we're so honored to be partnered, alhamdulillah, with HHRD in the U.S., Forgotten Women in the U.K., and Islamic Relief in Canada. Please do support them generously, inshallah. We'll share the links in the chat throughout the experience. So please make sure that you do whatever you're reminded, do, give as much as you can, inshallah, to them. As well, for the first time ever, Al Maghrib has our daily giving campaign, which is just a simple way to gain a lot of reward this Ramadan, inshallah. You can do as little as $2 a day, but it's a way to continuously give to the journey of students who are seeking beneficial knowledge into the, to the effort to change their lives, inshallah. And it's a huge source of Sadaqah Jariya. So make sure that you do contribute and sign up for daily giving. And I see that someone's Momina Jazakallah Khair has dropped that into the chat. So just open up that link and make that intention that you will register, inshallah, and automate your good deeds, especially at the beginning of these 30 days, alhamdulillah. Um, with that said, let's just run through some uh, really important uh, just kind of details and announcements just so that you guys can get situated. So we went over the schedule already. Uh, I know I get this question every single year. I know we're coming in from multiple different time zones that people are awake and doing sahur and writing to Sarawih if you're in kind of Europe in the UK. So in, alhamdulillah, our sessions are recorded. They're available uh, through the Ramadan 360 portal. They might stay up on social media as well, but the best place to find them is the Ramadan 360 portal. Uh, and you can find them, inshallah, about 24 hours after the session and you have lifetime access to them. So if you miss a session or you're late or anything, you're able to catch up to the rest of it. But I do encourage you guys to register and to attend live because this chat and this community and the videos of everybody is not in the recordings. So you miss out on a little bit of the experience if you're just watching from the recordings. Um, for those who have questions, and I'm sure many will come up throughout this experience, uh, we will have... Fatwa nights with Sheikh Walid Basuni and Sheikh Abu Isa Ni'matullah. They're already up in your portals with the dates and the times so that you can make sure you get all your Ramadan questions answered during or after the talks. We try to squeeze in a little bit of time for questions, but if we don't have the ability to do so, just hold on to the Fatwa nights, inshallah. Now, I see there's a lot of buzzing and a lot more people joining, mashallah, over 600, almost 700 of you in the chat box here. Uh, we welcome and we encourage you guys to chat away, to keep interacting and commenting during the session. But we ask, of course, for you to follow Islamic adab and guidelines. And this is supposed to be a safe and supportive environment. So to be respectful and to be kind. There's many people, mashallah, I see that who are coming in for the very first time. I want everyone to have a great experience. And if you guys are Ramadan 360 veterans, please make sure you help out the new students. You answer any questions that you already know, you know the answers to and, and keep the, the barakah going in the environment, alhamdulillah. And just a friendly reminder, we don't allow for outside links or solic solicitations or donations or anything like that here in the chat. This is just meant to be one community for Ramadan 360. Now, there's so much going on. I do want to encourage I, so those who are interested, who are asking a couple of questions, I'll get back to you, inshallah, afterwards, privately in the chat. But I do want to encourage you guys, if you've registered for Ramadan 360, which you should have, everyone who's, who's here on Zoom has, to join our Telegram group uh, and our WhatsApp channel. We have a Telegram group, a Telegram channel, and a WhatsApp channel to make sure that you get your reminders in every capacity, in every way that's convenient for you, inshallah. Plus, we have our email reminders as well. So please take some time to join them and make sure that you are keeping and uh, having your notifications on so you don't miss any important information. This is going to be a jam-packed month. I can't even tell you how many things we have going on. This is just the cliff notes, if, if you can believe it or not. Alhamdulillah. With that said, I don't want to take too much time. I'll be back here, inshallah, after Sheikh Sinaman's session and before our second part of today's program. But it is so amazing to have you all back in this community. I hope to see you guys here for the next 30 days as we spend a, a Baraka-filled Ramadan together, inshallah. And we'll share any details that you guys have questions about, inshallah, in the chat. But with that, I do want to bring on, alhamdulillah, our uh, Honorable Sheikh Suleiman Hani, mashallah, who is our, one of our celebrated instructors here at Al Maghrib Institute. I just found out he's taught over 80 classes, mashallah, at Al Maghrib. He's an author, he's a contributor at Yakin Institute, he's a Harvard grad, and most importantly, he's the head of our academics department here at Al Maghrib Institute, and he's responsible for some of the magic that we've created over the last few years. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh Suleiman. It's such an honor to have you with us today.
وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا سيستر حفصة رمضان مبارك to all of our brothers and sisters all around the world uh, بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه والله it is a blessing الحمد لله رب العالمين that we made it back to the month of Ramadan and that we have our brothers and sisters able to connect in this day and age all across the world we have so many diverse backgrounds ethnicities and ages here alhamdulillah rabbil alamin we have people from all walks of life we have even some non-muslim uh, relatives and community members with us joining us welcome as well you're learning about islam learning about ramadan with us this is our fourth year doing ramadan 360 and it is one of the greatest blessings because every single year we see alhamdulillah thousands of students not just giving positive feedback about their experiences through the 30 days of these programmings, but also thousands more registered every year. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, for the opportunity to connect to one another during these times, especially when things are difficult in the world, especially when calamity, injustice, oppression affects our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine and Sudan and East Turkestan and Yemen and every land and every place. May Allah bring down His swift justice, His mercy and keep our hearts united, Allahumma Ameen. So welcome to all of our dear brothers and sisters to our Ramadan 360 program. I wanna actually, since this is the very first session, I wanna introduce and set the scene for you, for all the other instructors that will be joining you, inshallah ta'ala. What is this course that you have joined? This course is all about fulfilling the purpose of life, living by the book, living by the revelation of God, living in a manner that is very practical, and it is also very suitable for every context. It's very timeless. How are we going to set the scene? I want us to go to the end of the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the 10th year after the Hijrah, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, the final month of the Islamic calendar, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did his first and only Hajj. May Allah grant us all and accept the Hajj at least once in our lives. Allahumma Ameen. And there, he shared many reminders. He delivered many sermons. It was a farewell address to the entirety of the ummah, to the world, because his message would be preserved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A few months after this, in Rabi' al-Awwal, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa passed away. One of the things that he said will set the scene for us. He said to the many people who are listening, وَسَتَلْقَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ You will soon, all of you will meet your Lord. And فَيَسْأَلُكُمْ عَنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ He will ask you about what you did, your actions. فَلَا تَرْجِعُنَّ بَعْدِ كُفَّارًا Do not go back to disbelief or misguidance because they weren't upon Islam until the Prophet ﷺ was given that final message. يَضْرِبُ بَعْضُكُمْ رِقَابَ about Some of you may even be killing one another. This is the days of, these were the days of Jahili. So the Prophet ﷺ then gives a command and this is our command. أَلَا لَيُبَلِّغِ الشَّاهِدُ الْغَائِبِ let the one who is present convey this message to the one who is absent. Why? For many who receive the message are or have a more retentive memory than the one who hears it or a better understanding of the message. And then he said, Did I convey the mission of Allah to you? Did I convey the message of truth to you? Did I not convey what I had to convey to you as a prophet? They said, yes. You did, Ya Rasulullah. You did. You conveyed the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qal Allahumma shahad. Allahumma shahad. Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was chosen to be the final prophet of Allah in this world and the first on the day of judgment to enter Jannah, the first to intercede for all of his ummah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he do his part? He did his part. Did he convey Islam to us? He conveyed Islam to us. Did we receive the message? Alhamdulillah, 1400 years later, we received the message of Islam. So when we think about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he gave us of Islam, we think about the opportunities that the Sahaba had to take forward, to move forward the uh, torch of Islam, if you will. And if you think about the torch of Islam, what are we referring to here? We're referring to the clarity of the message, the mission, and the ability to implement it. How do you implement what the Prophet ﷺ gave you? This is something I want us to keep in mind. The companions were trained in many things. When they took these principles, the principles of Islam, the principles of the Qur'an, they took principles that allowed them to live by it in a very comprehensive way. They took principles that we are following now in their footsteps, implementing them in our own lives. 
And I want us to think about what you need today, 1400 years later, with all that the Ummah has gone through, all the rich tradition and history and the legacy, the individuals that came and left, the people in your lineage who were here before you and the reason that you are here today. And the first Muslim, if you are not a convert, then the first convert in your uh, ancestry. May Allah bless all of our brothers and sisters who embrace Islam. Allahumma ameen. We have a mission and it is to live by the final revelation. It is the ultimate guidance. It is the means of reforming society. It is the reason that we are able to then address a structural injustice like a 75-year occupation in Palestine. It is through living by the book that we are able to address the injustices in our own communities. It is through the revelation that we are able to find ourselves fulfilled spiritually, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, happier with what we are doing, connected through our studies and our work. It is through the revelation that we are able to see society improve in the way people communicate with each other and deal with each other. It is through the revelation that you make it to paradise. And we ask Allah to grant us the highest levels of Jannah. Brothers and sisters, our course is all about living by the Quran, extracting all of the traits that you need to really maximize the benefit in your life because there is a potential every one of us has, but sometimes we miss out on that potential. And the missing out could be because we are not connected to the final revelation. That is what this class is about. How do we revive all this goodness? Where do we even begin? What theme is extremely important to start with before any other theme? Of course, the traits that we are covering today is a trait that is not a one-time implementation. It is an ongoing lifestyle. It is the topic of ikhlas, the topic of sincerity. May Allah grant us sincerity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us references to it throughout the Quran. And as I go through this, I'm going to share some stories and ask you some questions so you can engage in the chat and also think, inshallah ta'ala, so we can be very practical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalna ilayka al-kitab bilhaqqi fa'budillaha mukhlisan lahu al-deen. Indeed, we sent down the book to you, O Prophet, in truth. So worship Allah alone with sincere devotion to Him. Ala lillahi dinu al-khalis. Ala lillahi dinu al-khalis. Ala lillahi dinu al-khalis. This is the devotion that is sincere to Allah alone. Most Muslims know the hadith. Innam al-a'malu bin niyat. Actions are going to be judged by intentions. If you did something, it's about your intention. How do you think of this? I want to share a story. One time a young man, he said... I just want to know something that a lot of Muslims seem to struggle with. How do I know if an act of worship is accepted by Allah? If I did the right thing? How do I know Allah accepted this thing? Brothers and sisters, it's so simple. Every single one of you, inshallah ta'ala, those who, who know this, it's a reminder. Those who don't know this, inshallah, write this down. But it's so simple. Two things. Every single act of worship that is accepted by Allah is accepted because of two things. Number one, a sincere intention. You did it. For the sake of Allah. You're fasting Ramadan for Allah. You're giving in charity for Allah. You're seeking knowledge for Allah. Number one is a sincere intention. Number two is the correct action. How do you know if an action is correct? That's where we have to learn our religion. So if somebody says, I have a good intention, brother, I'm going to pray Maghrib 25 rak'ahs and all of you who are praying three rak'ahs, you guys are barely doing anything. He has a good intention. He wants to pray more. But come on, man, 25 rak'ahs, where did you get that from? You look to what the Prophet ﷺ taught. You look to what Allah commanded. That's how you know what to do. Sincere intention, correct action, and hope, inshallah ta'ala, that it is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this word that we use, so many Muslims throw the word around, and they've never thought, what does the word actually mean linguistically? The concept of ikhlas, if you think about its roots, it's referring to something that is clear, it's so clear you can see it through it. Sincerity, therefore, is the alignment, the clear alignment of the internal state you have and the external state in goodness. Again, ikhlas here, we are talking about reaching that optimal state where you are sincere internally and it's matching the external. It is the fragrance of your heart and your soul. It is the introduction to so many books of hadith. Sometimes learning about your intention is more important than learning about the action because the action requires a good and sincere intention. 
Today, inshallah ta'ala, I will share with you the short time that I have. I will be sharing with you a story of three and another story of three. Two different stories, both about three and much easier to remember this way, inshallah ta'ala. But both of these have very different results. Let's set the scene. You are all coming from different walks of life. We have over 1,000 people with us, alhamdulillah, rabbi alameen, and maybe another thousand who are listening on other platforms. And I want you to think about this following scenario. I see, alhamdulillah, some of the names here, some of my dear brothers and sisters. I see brother uh, Drew Amin Davis, may Allah bless you, alhamdulillah, from Toronto. Always nice to see familiar friends and faces. Brother Bassam, Sister Awan, may Allah bless you all. I'm just going in the order that I have on the screen. I want you to imagine in the countries and the cities that you are in, one day you go hiking. You're out in the middle of nowhere. And as you are traveling, you're trapped in a cave. A boulder blocks the entry to that cave. So now you're stuck with two other Muslims. Hopefully two other very good Muslims, inshallah ta'ala. What happens? One of them says, Ahmed, Amin, Rawan, Khadija, let's make dua. Let's make dua. Let's call upon God. And let's think of a sincere act of worship we did. And use that act of worship in our dua. That, oh Allah, if you know that I did this, sincerely for your sake, then allow us to be safe. Allow us to leave this difficult situation. Grant us relief. Ask yourself in this moment right now, what are some things, this is for you, you don't have to share. What are some things you would think of? An act of worship you know for sure. It's so sincere. It's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah bin Umar, radiyallahu anhum, may Allah be pleased with them, reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that there were three men who were walking and as they were out in nature, they were overcome by rain. They took refuge in a cave in a mountain and then a boulder blocked the entrance to that cave so they couldn't leave. One of them turned to the others and said, think of the good deeds that you have done sincerely for Allah so that you may ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua through these deeds, maybe he will relieve us. Maybe we'll be relieved of this difficulty. So one of them made dua. I'm going to paraphrase these stories. One of them said, Oh Allah, I had two parents who were very old in age and my wife and my young child. And I used to tend to the flock. When the evening time came, I used to milk the animals and I used to serve my parents before the rest of the family. I'm paraphrasing. Long story short, one day he comes home, the parents are asleep. And he waits by their bedside knowing they could wake up at any moment at night and they are very hungry. He came back very late. They were sleeping and he didn't want them to wake up with the pain of hunger for just a moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of brothers and sisters who are starving, who are suffering in Gaza and Sudan and all around the world who are looking for a morsel of food. Allahumma ameen. This man, he waits by his parents and finally they wake up and the rest of his family didn't eat yet. Finally the parents wake up and then he serves them. And then he serves them. And it was after dawn, after the morning time. Do you know what he says? He says, If you know, O Allah, that I did this only for your sake, then allow the boulder to move, allow us basically to have relief from this difficult situation, just so we can see the sky, meaning so we can be free. فَفَرَجَ اللَّهُ مِنْهَا فُرْجَةً فَرَأَوْ مِنْهَا السَّمَاءِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the boulder until they could see the sky. They were still stuck in the cave. They still could not escape. So the second man raised his hands and he made dua. Now the second man had a very different life experience. And likewise, every one of us here, over 1,000 of us who are listening to this live and the thousands who will listen later, inshallah, every one of us has a unique test in life. Don't think about the test of the other person that is not applicable to you, but think about how you respond to the questions Allah gave you. How are you dealing with your circumstances? This man raised his hands and made dua. Oh Allah, I had a cousin that I used to love more than any man could love a woman. And he was talking about this scenario and I have to be cautious with my words just to be suitable with the age that we have. Alhamdulillah, the ages of the youngsters listening. Long story short, he was about to commit a major sin with her. He was tempted. He was tempted. He was about to commit a major sin. And he offered her money to do to commit that sin. And right before he was about to commit the sin, right in the last few seconds, she said, Oh, servant of Allah, fear Allah. And she continued, fear Allah. The man was afraid, we can imagine. He was afraid. How do we know? He said, I left. I stood back up and I left her. And he left the money with her as well. And Ya Allah, if you know that I left this major sin, I abandoned this sin, even though the desire is there. Sometimes people say, but I have a desire. The desire is there. The man left it for the sake of Allah. He left it for the sake of Allah. And he said, Ya Allah, then relieve us of this distress. 
the boulder once again moved, meaning the dua was accepted. Think of how many desires you have that you withheld because you were going to possibly do something with the desire that was haram and you said, not that, not this way, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah saved them from that distress. Finally, the last man made dua, oh Allah, I used to have a man working for me for a portion of rice. That's how much money he owed him, just some rice. He finished his work and he told me, give me what I deserve. I offered his payment to him. He didn't accept it at the time. So I took it and continued to plant it. Imagine you have money and you owe somebody this money. You owe Bassam the money, you owe Ahmed the money. What do you do? The person left. So you took it, you invested it in stocks. You invested it in the stock market, in something else. You replanted the seeds. So what happens? It grew and grew and grew and grew. Imagine you invested $100 and a decade later it was like a million dollars. You did really well with it. That man that was owed the money came back and said, Fear Allah, do not violate my rights. Basically, give me what you owe me, that payment. Remember the payment from a long time ago? Do so you know what this guy said? He said, all of these flocks that you see, the cows and all of this, take it, it's yours. The guy came for a bag of rice. He said, take all of this, it's yours. He said, fear Allah, don't make fun of me. Don't make fun of me. In other words, like, come on, man. I came for a bag of rice. Don't make fun of me. He said, I'm not mocking you. Take the cow and its flocks. The man took them and left. Do you know what that means? Most people would think, you know what? All I owe you is the $100. I am the one reinvesting it. I'm the one who made the million. I only owe you 100 And that man would have never known. This man was so honest. The amount that was invested was not his. So he took all of it with its returns and gave it to that man. He said, Ya Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake, فَفْرُجْ لَنَا مَا بَقِيَ Then save us from what remains of the boulder. فَفَرَجَ اللَّهُ مَا بَقِيَ Allah removed what was left and they escaped from the cave. Now this is the first story of three. The, the story here is one with so many lessons, but I want you to imagine you were stuck in the cave. What is the thing that you would think of making dua through? Now, sometimes people say, listen, I was never in any of these situations. I can't relate to this hadith. You don't need to be in these situations. Sometimes it's not something drastic. Sometimes it's not something like just huge and, and monumental. It could be something simple, but you're doing it every single day. You're fasting every single day. You're praying sincerely every single day. You make dua. Nobody even knows about it every single day. You give in charity. Your own family does not know. Charity that you are giving every single day. When I start, when we started the session, I heard there was an opportunity to give charity today. The giving charity campaign. This is an example. When you are sincere, you have no idea the impact that it will have, but it's not just in this world. Because you know what you learn through this hadith? You learn that sometimes, sometimes, the thing that leads to the greatest relief in a moment of ultimate darkness is something you did not expecting to get anything back from it in this world. You did it for the sake of Allah because it was the right thing to do. The more sincere you are, the more impactful your deed. The more sincere you are, the more impactful your deed. And I swear to you, I cannot count the number of times Muslims from, from all walks of life in so many different countries. I think last December, alhamdulillah, I, I think I hit like 48 or 49 countries. It was New Zealand. May Allah bless our brothers and sisters all the way out there. Allahumma ameen. Uh, 18 hours ahead of where uh, where the rest of my family is. So one time a brother was sharing with me a story about charity. He said, I gave this charity and I was trying my best to be sincere. And I thought it was going to go to this one person, this one project, this one cause. He found out years later, the charity, the way it was it ended up being utilized in terms of its impact and its growth, he told me it ended up, ended up impacting thousands of people. I said, how? He's like, it just impacted thousands of people instead of the one, in my mind, I thought it's going to help in this one narrow way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnifies the impact of your deeds based on the level of your sincerity. You may never live to see it, but it's there with Allah until the day of judgment saved for you on the day that is most important. I want you to, to think of this question. I'm going to answer it very quickly. Rapid fire, rapid fire, very quickly, inshallah ta'ala. What are some of the benefits of sincerity, of ikhlas? What are some of the benefits that come from being sincere? You can type these in the chat and I will share with you as many as I can with the limited time that we have, inshallah ta'ala. Some of the amazing benefits of being sincere. Number one, the acceptance of your dua. Your dua is more accepted when you are sincere. Number two, contentment of the heart, happiness. Number three, blessings from Allah, reinforcement in your taqwa, in your guidance. So many people embrace Islam all uh, around the world and every day. 
from all walks of life. And some people lose their faith because they were not grateful. They were not sincere to Allah. May Allah protect us. Number four is victory and success in this life. Victory and success for the ummah as well. May Allah grant our ummah victory. May Allah bring down his swift justice and his relief for our brothers and sisters in every land and every place. Number five, you will have rewards on the day of judgment waiting for you. Number six, love from Allah and his angels as they call your name in the heavens. You might have social media and have no followers. And it doesn't matter because you are famous in the heavens. The malaika mention your name, not once or twice, but repeatedly your name. And they make dua for you because you are sincere in your acts of worship. Number seven is resilience. Sincerity grants you the strength to endure when things get tough, that you are able to withstand. Why? Why are you doing this? You're doing this for Allah. So your sincerity drives you to be stronger. Your sincerity drives you to continue to endure. Number eight is protection from sins. Yusuf is given as an example in the Quran. He's a sincere servant of Allah. The sincere cannot be tricked. The sincere cannot be attacked. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the scenario in the Quran that the devil tries to take people astray. Illa except for your sincere servants. May Allah protect us all and grant us sincerity. When you know why you're doing what you're doing, it protects you in so many different ways. This is recorded. So all the bullet points I shared, don't worry, you can watch the recording, go through them inshallah ta'ala. And finally, number 10, sincerity motivates you to continue to do good. Sincerity motivates you to keep doing good. Now, a lot of people ask, okay, you're talking about sincerity. What does that mean? We said in the very beginning, any act of worship you do, you're doing for the sake of Allah. The Allah I want you to accept. I want you to test out. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. And I see so many of you, mashallah, sharing in the chat. I want you to, to think of the example of hiding your good deeds. Type the words, don't send them. Don't, don't click enter, don't send it in the message. But type in the chat just the word act of worship. Just the words act of worship, but don't send it to us. Now, I know some people will not hear this part and probably still send it. Act of worship. Now, imagine it's there and there's a possibility of 1,000 people seeing your act of worship. But also, Jazakumullah khairan for actually sending it. You don't have to send it. Imagine now you click delete, start removing everything you typed. And you decided, Ya Allah, I don't care what people think. I just want you to accept it. Ya Allah, I don't care that people are watching. I just want you to accept it. And just imagine, you raise your hands, Ya Allah, grant me sincerity. Ya Allah, protect me from showing off. Ya Allah, grant me sincerity and protect me from showing off. Brothers and sisters, there's another story of three people, and this one I will summarize. On the Day of Judgment, the first people to be judged on that day. They will be people that were given many blessings in this world. One of them was a man who fought till he was martyred. He fought in a battle until he died. He gave his life. And Allah tells him, what did you do with the blessings that I gave you? To be grateful. He said, Ya Allah, I fought for your sake until I was martyred. I fought for your sake until I was martyred. He literally gave his life. And Allah says to him, you have lied. You fought so that people will call you courageous. And they did so. Meaning you got your reward in the previous life. And that's a very frightening statement and reminder to say something or do something hoping for reward in this world wondering if you're still going to get the reward of it in the next life. The man is told that he has lied and then he's thrown into the hellfire. A second man is brought forward, someone who gained a lot of knowledge, recited Quran and, and facilitated it for others. And same thing, what did you do with the blessings I gave you? The man actually showed off and he lies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's thrown into the fire for that. And the third is a man who gave a huge charity. He was very generous, whatever he could, he was always giving in charity, but it wasn't for Allah. It was so that people will say, you're so generous. He got his reward. Just as the worst, just as the best of people are the prophets, the worst of people are those who try to act like they are prophets, the imposters, and then the righteous, and then the righteous, and then the righteous. Don't fake your righteousness. Don't care about what people think. And don't overthink it, but don't become neglectful. Now, a lot of people ask, well, how do I know if I'm sincere? How on earth do I know that I'm doing the right thing? I'm not showing off. Brothers and sisters, what helps you to fight riya, showing off, which can destroy your, your own soul and destroy the ummah as well. Number one, remember the hadith of these three people, the three in the cave and the three on the day of judgment. Number two, remember in the act of worship to keep renewing your intention and don't stop. Shaitan tries to get people to think, I don't want to show off. I don't want to be insincere. And then they'll stop doing acts of worship. Renew your intention, but keep moving forward. Number three, remember this. On the day of judgment, the only person who can reward you for your good deeds is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
You know how we have over a thousand people here? None of us will be able to on the day of judgment say, okay, go ahead. You can have all these hasanat. I accept it. Well, we are not in that position. Allah is the one who accepts your deeds. You're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us. The Prophet was worried about the Sahaba, more afraid for them about their intentions than about a Dajjal, as he said to the Sahaba. I'm more worried about you from a shirk al khafi, the hidden type of shirk, idolatry. It's the one where people are trying to beautify their prayer because somebody else is watching. So, what's an action item you can take from this? Make sure your prayer in private is better than the prayer that people see in public. That's a minimum standard every Muslim should have because of how often we pray and how obvious it is when you're in the masjid and in front of others that this is an act of worship. Make sure your salah in private is better than your salah in public. And if you're trying your best in public, try your best in private. It should be similar to or better, but it should never be worse. It should never be messing around with your salah in private. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important audience to you. That is sincerity. Sincerity is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It's an ongoing ibadah. And you're given reminders through the Quran. You're living by the book. You're given reminders from good gatherings like this, from good friends. Alhamdulillah, I mean, for good companionship, supporting one another, advising each other, not over praising each other, but making dua for each other. May Allah accept from you. May Allah accept from you. May Allah accept from you. And of course, there are many dua. I will share with you two of these supplications. The first is the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he taught the Sahaba to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. Allah, we seek refuge with you from knowingly associating anything with you and we seek your forgiveness for that which we do unknowingly. This is a very famous uh, hadith, it's a very famous dua, but there's also another one that a lot of people uh, would benefit from inshallah ta'ala. And this one, I want you to try to implement as much as you can because it's short and it's sweet and it's very straightforward. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an used to make this dua. He used to say, Allahumma ja'al amali salihan. وَجَعَلْهُ لِوَجْهِكَ or وَجَعَلْهُ لَكَ خَالِصًا Both are possible. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ لِأَحَدٍ فِيهِ شَيْئًا This is a very important dua. اللهم جعل عملي صالحا Allah make my deeds righteous. Make it for your sake alone and do not give anyone a share of it. Meaning this is not for the people. Showing off will backfire. What can you do in the month of Ramadan? Prayers that nobody else is aware of. Prayer that nobody else is aware of in quality and quantity. The second is charity, and the third is dua. Charity, dua, and prayer are three simple acts of worship everyone can do, and they can hide from other people. You know, in this day and age of social media where people like to share everything, don't share everything. Don't share everything. Many things you want to, to hide. I know sometimes we want to encourage people, but don't share everything. Many things you want to hide so that on the day of judgment, you're pinning your hopes on something you know. Nobody else is aware of. Just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the angels that are recording it for you. You know there's no doubt this is only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have your share of private deeds. Like the example that you had when you were typing in the chat and you took it away and said, you know what? I don't want anyone to see this. Right now, take a moment and ask Allah for sincerity. Oh Allah, grant us sincerity and consistency. Oh Allah, protect us from showing off. Paradise is worth it. Allah's pleasure is worth it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talked about those who pray while people are asleep that they will have a place in paradise. You can see the outside from the in and the in from the out. Obviously, back then, they might have not understood maybe how that could be. And they asked, who is this for, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Liman alana al-kalam, for the one who speaks gentle words. They feed the poor. And they pray and they stand in prayer while people are asleep, sincerely for the sake of Allah. Sincerely for the sake of Allah. Brothers and sisters, our ummah will always go through different types of hardships. And there's a lot of good in the ummah. There are a lot of uh, great people in the ummah. There's a lot of great works in the ummah. Alhamdulillah, a lot of great efforts taking place. A lot of changes that are coming as well, inshallah ta'ala. If you want to be part of reviving the ummah, renewing the ummah with the limited time that you have, then be sincere. It is the foundation of living by the Qur'an. Be sincere. It is the foundation. And if you want to encourage others within your family, you can encourage them, inshallah ta'ala, but remind them as well, especially children. Remind them that it's not just that your parents saw you. It's not mama and baba saw you praying, so you're good. Because if the parents are not around, you want them to still pray. Rather tell them, alhamdulillah, you prayed. May Allah accept from you. Allah is watching you. The angels are watching you. The angels are praying for you. Allah is mentioning your name. Remind them to have sincerity because it is the foundation of everything that will follow. It is the foundation of reviving the ummah. It is the foundation 
and his sincerity as a scholar say that, that moves mountains, it builds civilizations, it predominates and overcomes evil in the world. Sincerity is the foundation for every Islamic organization, every Islamic administration, every family, every husband and wife. It is the foundation of the uh, relationship that the believer has between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to grant us sincerity. We ask Allah to grant us sincerity. We ask Allah to grant us sincerity and to really apply it when any opportunity arises. Take advantage Move fast towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is a sign of your sincerity. Again, I was told just as we started, subhanAllah, and I did not relate this to what I had, but it just worked out perfectly, that you have an opportunity today to automate your giving, inshallah, your charity in the month of Ramadan through the process that Al-Maghrib Institute has set up. Take advantage. This is a great way to implement what we just learned, alhamdulillah. But ask Allah as you're giving this charity, as you're typing in your information. Ask Allah for sincerity, for it will impact the reward that you have. It will impact, inshallah ta'ala, magnify the reward that you have. May Allah accept from all of us, forgive us for shortcomings and allow us to see days of justice, days of victory, days of support through our righteous actions and the divine blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakum al to all of you for your wonderful interactions, your comments, your chat, and inshallah ta'ala, your questions as well. Subhanakla, alhamdulika, ashalu la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, and I'll hand it back, inshallah ta'ala, to Sister Hafsa. Amazing. Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh Suleiman. Never disappointing, mashallah, with our first hyped, exciting session of Ramadan 360. I hope that you guys got a lot of gems from that session, and I hope that you shared them with us in the Telegram group so that others can benefit to your, your, for your contributions as well, inshallah. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. I don't know if we have enough time to do questions for today, inshallah, but we have plenty of opportunities to, Sheikh, to see Sheikh Salaman Hani throughout the rest of Ramadan 360. He's going to be back four or five times, I think, inshallah, so you'll get a chance to benefit. Sheikh Jazal Khair, as always, for an amazing talk and an amazing reminder, alhamdulillah. Um, with that said, I know there's a lot of people who couldn't join us after a certain point. So just a heads up. Yes, we did hit the Zoom, Zoom capacity. I tried to notify you guys here before we were about to hit it. Um, so inshallah tomorrow, we are going to increase it. But a good practice for you all is to join us a few minutes early. We're continuing with the program, by the way, inshallah. This is the first part that's just been completed. And alhamdulillah, we're going to be joined by Usada Taymiyyah Zubair for our Quran Reflect session, inshallah. I'm just going to pause the chat just so we can uh, focus for just a second, inshallah. Uh, with that said, so do join Ramadan 360 if you're watching on Zoom uh, on YouTube and you weren't able to get in. Uh, do register for the seminar if you haven't already for the for the virtual class, and we will expand the capacity. Try to join early. We'll be open early so that you guys can get a seat, inshallah. Jazakallah to those who did make that energy and that effort and who are with us now, alhamdulillah. You will have, uh, when you do register for Ramadan 360, you haven't already, you'll get access to submit your questions for the Fatwa Nights, first access to the Zoom, the ability to interact in the chat, and all these additional reminders, alhamdulillah, that you can get to make sure that you don't miss any sessions and any bonuses and resources that we have available for you guys at all. I know Sheikh Suleiman already did a beautiful reminder for the, for the daily giving campaign that we announced at the beginning of this talk, alhamdulillah. But before we segue into da our daily Quran Reflect, which, by the way, is going to be a lot more interactive, so get ready to have your mics unmuted, your cameras on on and to speak and to share reflections with Usada Taymiyyah after she begins her reminder. I just have a quick reminder as well to share before we jump into that. Bismillah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the most beloved actions to Allah are the most consistent, even if they're small. And what a better way to create consistent goodness than to support Al-Maghrib daily in Ramadan. You see, people think learning about Islam stops in childhood, but seeking knowledge is a sacred duty for everybody. And when you educate just one Muslim adult, about their deen, you're impacting all of society. That Muslim will share that knowledge with their friends, their children, their communities. And just like that, your one donation creates a snowball effect that doesn't just change one life, it changes the entire ummah. And inshallah ta'ala, you get the reward for all of it. That's why this Ramadan, we're inviting you to make the biggest impact by educating Muslim adults worldwide. And it starts with a small donation that you give every single day. Join us in our daily giving campaign. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and accept from you. And there you go. The link there should be in the chat. We'll drop it again. That was Sheikh Ammar, who you're going to see later in our Ramadan 360 programming. Uh, but with that said, we also want to give a shout out to our amazing charity sponsors who make Ramadan 360 possible every year and who come back with us year after year. Alhamdulillah. In the U.S., we're supported and helped by uh, HHRD, alhamdulillah. In the UK, it's Forgotten Women. And in Canada, it is Islamic Relief Canada, alhamdulillah. Please support them as they take care, of, once again, of those in our ummah who don't have the ability to support themselves and those who are in the greatest need, especially in Palestine. 
Um, with that said, now it is time for one of my favorite parts of Ramadan 360, which is our daily Quran Reflect sessions. And this year, alhamdulillah, every single day we're going to be spending that time with Ustada Taymiyyah Zubair, alhamdulillah. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this is an opportunity for you to have a, a, a guidance, kind of the dabr and tafsir with Ustada Taymiyyah. And then you guys get a chance to stretch your tadabr muscles and to kind of put into practice a lot of the things that we've been discussing in today's session, inshallah. Um, we'll have Ustada speak first, and then you guys can raise your hands when she asks you to. Uh, when you're ready to make our share a reflection, inshallah. And we do encourage you guys to have your cameras on if you're able to. It makes it a lot more interactive, alhamdulillah. Please try to keep your reflections brief so that we can try and give everyone a fair chance. And we'll try to, try to make it as equal as possible, inshallah. Um, with that said, it is an honor to bring back Ustada Taymiyyah Zubair. She's, mashallah, uh, our second female instructor, alhamdulillah, within Al Maghrib Institute. She's been touring with us on site and she's been, just finished teaching a class with us virtually, alhamdulillah, with Al Maghrib Live Virtual. And we're so honored to spend the entire month of Ramadan with her. So without further ado, uh, please welcome her onto the screen, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ustada Zaytaniya, how are you doing? Wa, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, happy to be here. Uh, it's very exciting, actually. Uh, it just seems like it was yesterday. We were in this class together and mashallah, the whole year has gone by so fast. Uh, alhamdulillah for the blessing of being able to gather together uh, with the Quran uh, to to remember Allah and to connect with his words uh, alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah. And the, the honor right. is, is doing that daily and consistently, alhamdulillah, through the daily Quran Reflect, which we're going to have after Ramadan 360 session each day of our lives. So, Ustada, I'm going to pass it off to you. We look forward to reflecting with you. Bismillah. Jazakillah khayran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlu al-uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So inshallah, in the Quran Reflect uh, portion of the class, we are going to be uh, looking at various verses throughout the Quran that are related to a, the, the theme of the day. And today, inshallah, as Sheikh Suleiman Hani mentioned, we will be talking about sincerity. But before we do that, I want to mention, I, I want to remind myself and you about the benefit of reflecting on the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that this is a book that is mubarak, that is blessed. And he has sent it down so that we reflect on its verses. And this shows us that reflecting on the verses of the Qur'an is something that is extremely beneficial for us. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are, you know, cutting down on maybe your nap time or maybe whatever that you could be doing at this time. You're leaving that in order to spend time with the Book of Allah. And this is an excellent choice that you are making because you are choosing to spend time with the Word of Allah, with the Book of Allah, which is the source of endless goodness for all of us. You know, there are scholars who would say that we busied ourselves with the Quran and the blessings of Allah, they surrounded us. And the moment we connected ourselves with the book of Allah, we invested just a little bit into it. The you know Allah's mercy, his blessings, they completely encompassed, engulfed, you know, uh, it, they basically surrounded us. So when you connect with the book of Allah, inshallah, you will benefit from it more than what you even imagined, more than what you, you will take from the Quran, more than what you came to get from it. And Ibn Qayyim also mentioned that there is nothing that is more beneficial for the slave of Allah, for, for his dunya and for his akhirah, except reflecting on the Quran. Meaning something that will benefit you in dunya, in akhirah, something that will draw you closer to Allah, is what? It is reflecting on the book of Allah, spending time with the Qur'an. So with that, let's begin right away. And we will begin with Surah Al-Fatiha. And earlier, you learned about the concept of sincerity. MashaAllah, there was so much to take from Sheikh, Suleimani, uh, Sheikh uh, Suleiman Hani's um, uh, session. 
uh, about the about the meaning, the the benefit, the importance of sincerity. In Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, "Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin." All praise is for Allah, who is the Lord of the worlds. Surah Al-Fatiha is a is a very um, important surah, which is why we have to recite it in every rak'ah of salah. We're praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and hamd is one of the best forms of worshiping Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. To praise Allah, to glorify Allah is one of the best ways of worshiping Allah. In hadith, we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to be praised. Alhamdulillahi. Allah is the best name of all the names of Allah. Right? Who is Allah? He is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. The one who has created everything, the one who owns everything. The one who provides for everything, without whom nothing can exist. And Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is mentioned, right? Which is the most important thing that we, we are all in need of. Without his mercy, we could not exist. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Maliki Yawmiddin, the fact that he is the sovereign of the day of judgment. And this is the greatest manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's glory and power. Because on that day, there will be no king, no one in power, no one with any authority except Allah Azza wa Jal, Maliki Yawmiddin. And then we are taught to say, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. It is you alone we worship. And you alone, we ask for help. Only Allah we worship. Why? Because this is the greatest right of Allah. That we worship only Allah and no one else. And astarin, we seek only Allah's help. Because this is our right as the slaves of Allah. That we ask Him for help. Because he is the only one who is capable, who is able to give us what we are in need of. Then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the most important thing, which is, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. And then the best people are mentioned who were guided. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Oh Allah, show us the path of those people whom you were, whom you bestowed your favor upon. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Not of those who, who, who received your anger, nor of those who went astray. Now we see that in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the most important lesson, which is, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ That, oh Allah, it is only you we worship, no one but you. And this means that anything that we do for the sake of Allah, anything that is supposed to be for the sake of Allah, any religious act, any religious deed, or anything that we even leave, we leave it for who? Only for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Meaning we seek Allah through our deeds and through our statements and even through those things that we are leaving. Like, for example, you may be fasting right now. Well, why are you staying away from food and drink? Why are you leaving these things? Who's, you know, what is it that you are seeking? You are not seeking to just deprive yourself. The, the objective of fasting is not to, you know, deprive yourself and just stay hungry. No, we fast in a way that we eat before we fast and then we eat when we break this fast. And many people have a problem with that. They think this is not real fasting because you're having two meals a day. Well, guess what? We're not fasting for you. We're not fasting to prove that we are very strong and that we can, you know, we, we can really deprive ourselves of food and drink for so many hours. This is not a competition. This is in order to please Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is the entire concept of ikhlas, of sincerity, that whatever we are doing, we are doing only for him. 
And that means we will do it in the way that he wants us to. We will do it in order to please him, even if people dislike it. Even if people have a problem with us doing certain things, believing in certain things, wearing certain things, not doing certain things, people may have a problem, but they can have it. They, they, they can dislike what we do, you know, but it doesn't affect us because we do what we do for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you learned about the meaning of ikhlas, that ikhlas is basically when something is pure, Right? It is when something is so clear that it is free from any kind of mixture. right? Anything that is not supposed to be in it, all right? it, is, it, it, it is free from anything that is not supposed to be in it. This is basically what ikhlas is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about how uh, you, there's a lesson for you in, in the cattle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you to drink something that comes out of the cattle, meaning milk, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as something that comes out from between farthin wa damin, from between dung and blood. All right? But what is it that comes out? Lebanon khalisan, milk that is pure, meaning it is not mixed with any blood or any dung. It is pure milk. So what does it mean to be sincere to Allah? To be sincere to Allah means that you are pure for Allah. What you do is purely for Allah. What you say is only for Allah. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. I want you to imagine this. Imagine you're breaking your first fast. All right. And you reach out for a nice samosa. Okay. And you take it, you break a piece of it, and you see that there is a long hair. All right. That is inside of the samosa. What would you do to that samosa? Would you eat it? Would you eat it? You would not eat that samosa at all. Oh, some people will, mashallah. Okay. But the majority of the people will not eat something that is mixed with something that does not belong in it, right? You wouldn't like it for yourself. You wouldn't like it for anyone else. Allah Azza wa Jal does not accept deeds that are done for him and someone else. And Allah does not accept deeds that are supposed to be for him, but are done for someone else. All right. So look at Surah Al-Baqarah now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the hypocrites. All right. Right towards the beginning. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that among the people are those who say, in verse number eight, that among the people are those who say, we believe in Allah in the last day, but they're not truly believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept their iman. They're saying that we believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept it. Why? Because when they say we believe, do they actually believe in Allah? Do they actually say this for the sake of Allah? No. They say this in order to be accepted by people. In order to be praised by people. In order to you know, gain the benefits that people would give them because of their accepting Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept the Islam of such people. Why? Because it is not for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts only those deeds that are done for him. Now the thing is, when a person is sincere to Allah, only then can they have consistency. Right? Continue in Surah Al-Baqarah. When you move to verse number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example of the hypocrites. That their example is like that of um, a storm, basically, right? There's darkness, there's thunder, there's lightning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, alahum mashawfi, That every time there's light, even, even for a few seconds because of the lightning, they walk. All right? 
وَإِذَا أَظْلَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَامُوا But when it becomes dark, they stop. So when there's light, one of the interpretations is that when there's ease, the hypocrites are willing to do the things that Muslims do. But when there's darkness, meaning when there's difficulty, when things are not that easy, then what happens? They stop. They don't strive in the way of Allah. Sincerity becomes a means of motivation. Sincerity brings you consistency. Now, in Surah Al-Baqarah, as we move on, on the same page, verse number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about who He is, right? And why we should worship Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the fact that He is the one who has, you know, made the earth for us and the sky a canopy for us. He is the one who causes water to, uh, you know, come down to the earth. And He is the one who produces you know, different things from the earth as sustenance for us. And Allah says, فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا Do not set up rivals for Allah. Meaning, why would you do something for someone other than Allah when they didn't make you, when they didn't give you any food or drink, when they didn't make the earth or the sky or anything, what have they done for you? And really, if, if you think about it, sometimes we, you know, our, our intention becomes corrupt because we begin to expect some kind of reward from people. And anytime you're tempted, ask yourself, what can people give me? If they hear about the fact that I did such and such, that I'm doing such and such, what, what can they give me? What can they benefit me with? Because didn't the Prophet wasallam say that if all of the people were to gather together, they would not be able to benefit you with anything except with something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for you. Right, And if all of them gather together to harm you with something, they wouldn't be able to harm you with anything except something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has already decreed for you. So what can people give me? How, how could they possibly benefit me? And even if they do benefit me, let's say people like you a lot. Right. Sheikh Suleiman mentioned about, you know, not sharing everything on social media. Let's say you're tempted to, you know, brag about something that you something good you did and you share that. For example, right. The intention over here is to impress people, to, to brag. What do you get? Maybe 500 likes, maybe 50 likes, maybe a thousand likes. Well, what's going to happen to those likes? Do they convert into dollars? And even if they did convert into dollars, what happens to the dollars that you make? Do they sit with you forever? No. Money comes and money goes, isn't it? And even when you buy stuff with the money that you like, then, then what happens to that stuff? Is it meant to stay with you forever? No. مَا عِنْدَكُمْ ينفد وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ باق. Whatever is with you is going to run out. It's going to finish. And what is with Allah is going to remain. It is going to stay forever. So do what you do for Allah only. Now, if you, if you continue to look at Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 40 and verse number 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Bani Israel, وَإِيَّا farhabun, وَإِيَّا فتقون, That fear only me. Have taqwa only of me. Meaning, don't fear people. And that's the thing. When you have sincerity, then sincerity protects you against the fear of people. It makes you brave. Because you're seeking Allah. You're seeking Allah's approval. And this means that you love Allah more than anyone else. You fear Allah more than anyone else. So, Sincerity protects you against the fear of people and it enables you to leave what is wrong and to do what is right also, right? The story that you heard about the first three men, 
right? The, the first man, why was he able to stand all night in order to serve his parents? Why? Because he was sincere in seeking the, the pleasure of Allah. Why was the second man able to leave what is haram when he was when he was about to do it right at that instant he was able to leave it? Why? Because of sincerity. When you're sincere to Allah, you're actually able to leave what is wrong. Why was the third man able to be so generous? Why? Because of sincerity. So sincerity allows you to do what is right and to leave what is wrong because it brings you confidence it connects you with allah it brings you the 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 highest purpose and when there's sincerity then what happens no good deed is beneath a person and i want you to uh, think about ibrahim alayhi salam because in the first juz Towards the end, we learn about Ibrahim alayhi salam, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ When his Lord said to him, surrender. And Ibrahim alayhi salam said, أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I have surrendered to the Lord of the worlds. When Ibrahim alayhi salam said that I have surrendered to the Lord of the worlds, what does that mean? That everything I do, everything I do, I do it for you. You tell me to do this, I do it. You tell me to leave this, I will leave this. You tell me to go here, I, I will go there. Right? Ibrahim salam, he was sincere to Allah. And look at the kind of things he did. I want you to look at verse number 125 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those of you who don't have it with you right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ibrahim salam, that uh وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِّرَ بَيْتِي That we instructed Ibrahim and Ismail, both of them, to cleanse my house. For who? For the people who come there to worship. لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكَعِ السُّجُودِ What is Ibrahim السلام, doing over here? Cleaning the house of Allah. Right? Okay. Now what happens? Look at verse number 127. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ Ibrahim a.s. and Ismail a.s. both of them are building the Kaaba. And what are they saying? They're saying, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ minna. Our Lord, accept this from us. Okay. Look at the next ayah. Ayah 128. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكْ our Lord, make us those who surrender to you. And then they say, وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا Show us our rituals. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا And pardon us. What is Ibrahim salam doing? He is building the Kaaba, cleaning the house of Allah, all right, and asking Allah for acceptance. And he's asking Allah for forgiveness. And he's also asking Allah that, oh Allah, teach us, Adina Manasikana, teach us how to worship you. What do you understand from what is mentioned about Ibrahim? Feel free to type or uh, take the microphone. When it comes to uh, the, the way of Ibrahim, how he obeyed and worshiped Allah, uh, what, what can we learn from his example? in terms of sincerity. Okay, I see humility. All right, very good. Um, mashallah, the, okay, selfless devotion, very good. Complete submission and trust in Allah. Okay, he stayed humble. All right, so since there's so many points about uh, hu humility, that's the thing. When a person is sincere to Allah, then no good deed is beneath them. When a person is sincere to Allah, they're willing to do anything for the sake of Allah. Because it's not about the action itself. It's about who you're seeking through that action. It's not the deed that matters. It's the, it's the goal that you're seeking. 
right? Like we learn about Imam Bukhari, that how he once saw a small twig, like, like a thorn basically, in the, in the masjid. And he just picked it up and put it in his sleeve so that he could go and throw it outside. Can you imagine picking up something so tiny, all right, carrying it with oneself, why? Because he wanted to be of those who clean the, the mosque. Why? Because this is something that Allah commanded his prophets to do. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. One could argue that, well, it's not my job to be vacuuming the floor, right? To be cleaning, you know, to be picking people's, uh, you know, garbage off of the floor. It's not my job. This is beneath me. Oh my God, this is so disgusting. No, Imam Bukhari doesn't do that. He just picks it up. Sincerity allows you to do a variety of good deeds. And humility means that you are that that you, you, you don't feel that you are above certain deeds. All right. Uh, all right. Somebody had raised their hand, I think. Afsa? I saw it. Let's see those hands again. I think they lowered okay. it. But no, um, no worries. Okay. No worries. Okay. What else do we see? Um, okay, I think I, all right. Uh, yes, who who you're trying to please, sincerely devoted, it sounds like love, brings the best from us, excellent. Sabr and motivation, complete tawakkul, yes. Sincerity leads to complete tawakkul. You are, because you're seeking Allah, and so you you trust him, right? You you are You are committed. Complete reliance, excellent. Un unwavering faith, excellent. One more thing that I wanted to point out is the fact that he is asking Allah to accept his deeds. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Our Lord, accept this from us. When a person is sincere, what is their ultimate goal? What is it that they're seeking? They're seeking reward from Allah right? Pleasing Allah. So a person who is sincere is critical of his actions, right? Of, of their performance. But of course, being critical needs to be in, in a healthy, you know, moderation. Uh, but being, but being critical means that one is aware that yes, my fasting is not perfect. You know, I wasn't supposed to get angry, but I got angry. My fasting was not perfect. I, sh I should have spent more time in worshiping Allah, and I didn't. I could have done this better. So then, when you're sincere to Allah, and you're asking, and your hope is, your wish is that Allah accepts your deeds, what do you do? You ask Allah, Rabbana taqabbal minna, our Lord, accept this from us. Let your mercy compensate for my weakness, for my deficiency, for, for where I fall short. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Very good. Being critical should come from our awareness of our imperfection, but being hopeful of his mercy. Exactly. That's why you ask Allah for acceptance. Right? Otherwise, a person is just wishing and hoping for, yeah, yeah, my, you know, I'm I'm done this. Of course, I need to move on to something else. And a person eventually begins to think very highly of themselves, right? Um, good. Did somebody else raise their hand? Did I see a raised hand, or was that an accident again? Okay, all right. Um, oh, we got it. We got we got a raised hand, Isada. Let's okay. take somebody on the mic, inshallah. All right, Bismillah, Brother Uthman, the mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Yes, concerning the, we always try to seek the face of Allah because when you seek the face of Allah, you earn that one, then almost everything is sorted out for you. That has given you the pathway to success forever and ever, inshallah. Inshallah. Barakallahu uh, feekum. Maryam, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. 
Um, I was just wondering, you know, when you want to make a, you want to do a good deed and you want to be sincere, but you also really badly want to tell um, someone close to you, like maybe your spouse or your parents or your parents-in-law. Um, so uh, to what extent can you actually like um, maintain sincerity, but also want to tell other people without it being showing off? you know, and mm -hmm. in meddling with the intentions? Very good question. Because, you know, on the one hand, we, we're also encouraged to share some of our good deeds with others or do them publicly so that people uh, know that, yes, we are someone who is committed to Islam. And at the same time, you know, uh, our deeds can also serve as a motivation, as, as an example for them. Um, and sometimes you want to share these uh, you know, good news basically with your loved ones because you wanna you 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 want to share that happiness, right? So the the only way is to keep monitoring yourself. All right, to keep monitoring yourself, and this is actually very important that you monitor your heart, you monitor the things that you say to yourself, right? And another thing is that do not expect any reward from them, from people. Reward can be in the form of praise. It can be in the form of their acknowledgement. It can be in the form of, you know, their uh, sharing that good news with, with more and more people, right? Them treating you in, in a better, nicer way. That we should not expect any gratitude nor any kind of reward from people, right? So, for example, you share something like this with your mother. Alhamdulillah, she smiles. She says, Alhamdulillah. But then don't think, oh my God, that's it. That, that's all you're going to say? I did something so big and that's all you're going to say? Uh, so, the main thing is monitor yourself, right? And secondly, uh, do not have expectations of people. Have expectations of Allah Azza wa Jal. Aisha? Assalamu alaikum. Um, Jazakumullah khair for the opportunity. And what I want to add is the fact that um, one thing that I keep reminding myself is that I should be able to do things or good deeds for people that may not necessarily be able to pay me back. So if I have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do things for mm -hmm. people, for for instance, orphans in an orphanage or people that I may not cross paths with or I may not expect anything returned from, then I believe that, inshallah, through those deeds, it may be able to help me to reduce my expectation of some kind of recognition or praise. Jazakallah. That's an excellent suggestion. Uh, Amina. Assalamu alaikum. Um, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to sitting here to be sitting here and learning. Um, one question I had was so you know about intentions when we're doing some things. So for a while, actually, it has been a thing that. If I want to go out and volunteer in the masjid and like this thing in my heart constantly keeps telling me that, oh, um, you might be doing this for praise. And it kind of stopped me from do doing those like good deeds and volunteering. And so I know it's like shaitan and I'm trying my best to work on it. But what is something you recommend to still do those good deeds, <clears throat> but also like not expect, you know, praise or those things from people? Mm -hmm. So when, when shaitan tells you that don't do this because then you'll be showing off, um, the best thing is to oppose shaitan and, and go do it anyway and say it out loud, this is for Allah. Lillah, this is only for Allah. This is only for Allah. I'm, you know, you can also repeat this to yourself that I am doing this only for the sake of Allah. And, um, Perhaps once one thing that you could do is, especially because volunteering at the masjid can be a very public act, if you feel like certain roles are such that whenever you are given those, 
you you may feel like your intention is becoming corrupt. So there, um, you know, maybe try to look for a a task that is less public or that allows you to be more humble, um, and you know that that allows for better sincerity. Inshallah, Christina. Assalamualaikum. Hi. Um, I was just thinking, you know, when you talk about sincerity, um, how do we know or how what, what would you recommend um, for us to keep track of our sincerity? And how do we know that we are sincere for the sake of Allah? And when we talk about like how we are doing things um, for the sake of Allah, how would, and, and, you know, we hope to get rewards from Allah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, how is that? sincere when we expect something in return um, such as reward just like Allah so the the number one thing is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sincerity and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the acceptance of your deeds no matter uh you know it's possible you feel that yeah I I was very sincere when I did this or I was not very sincere when I did this regardless of how you're feeling Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sincerity and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the acceptance of your deeds. The second thing is that when you face some hardship or some kind of difficulty in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then at that time, remind yourself that this is something that I'm doing for Allah and make yourself do it anyway. Uh, because we learn about the hypocrites that you know when things are easy, they do it. When things are difficult, they leave. So make yourself consistent. And this can look like, for example, <clears throat> you're praying salah in the night. And after praying two rakah, you tell yourself, well, it's not fault to pray tahajjud or it's not fault to pray qiyamul layl. So you know what? I'm just going to take it easy. No, you, you tell yourself, no, I'm seeking the pleasure of Allah here. And I want to pray as much as the Prophet ﷺ prayed. So my goal is eight rakah. Right. The more you align yourself with the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, in earlier we we learned that there's two conditions for the acceptance of deeds: the fact that they are sincere and the fact that they are uh, in alignment with uh, the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, make yourself do the the things that you said you would do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Right. Nurulain. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I had a question in terms of how do we, um, so if we want to, like, one of the biggest things is, you know, intention. You need to have sincere intention. So how do, do I, because I struggle with that a lot, how do I make sure that my intention is sincere? Because, for example, if I'm studying, sitting down to study, my dad tells me that, you know, even studying can be a form of prayer. Uh, because if your, you know, if your intention is for Allah, but well, I'm, I really struggle with how to convert that into intention. If that makes sense. So, for example, you're studying, right? You're going to study honestly, in the sense that, you know, for example, you're taking an exam, you're preparing for a test, you're not looking for loopholes through which you can cheat, or you're not going to be using. Um, chat GPT to answer all of your questions. No, you're going to be honest over here, right? You're, you're going to do the best that you can uh, and you want to learn these skills or this knowledge. Why? In order to be a better uh, human, better Muslim, better worshiper. All right. So this is one way through which you can uh, make your worldly actions rewardable as well, inshallah, through the change of intention. Omar? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I also had similar questions. Um, I want to ask: uh, Do I need to worry about my intention if, uh, suppose, an act of worship, for example, salah, and we men we go to the mosque in congregation, we offer it in congregation. So, do I need to worry if I feel like I enjoy? an act of worship more in some righteous company more than when I am not in that righteous company. And secondly, if my question is that uh, what we select uh, to wear uh, when we go to the mosque. So for example, if someone 
uh, uh, has a problem with their so they uh, with any headwear so their intention is not to look uh, religious but they want to just cover their head so is it uh, like do i need to worry about these things yeah just that. um if it is possible for you to comment yeah, on yeah. this uh, the thing is that um definitely when you are in righteous company this is something that helps you in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladhina yad'oona rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi. That stay in the company of those people who call upon their Lord morning and evening. Yuriduna wajha. They're seeking his face. Meaning they're only seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's approval. Right? They're there to worship Allah. So you should be in their company. Why? Because being in good company affects you. It, it, it benefits you. However, if you find in yourself that you're only praying salah when you're with people in the masjid and you're not praying when you're at home or that your prayer is not as good as it is in the masjid. And by good, I mean that the way that you're performing your ruku, your sujood, it's very sloppy, it's not you know, the way that you should be, then that is a dangerous sign. The solution to that, however, is not that you stop going to the masjid. The solution to that is that you improve your worship in private, inshallah. Solange? Hmm. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so the, the questions about not expecting any thanks and so on, we when we see somebody being mistreated, it it makes one angry. Allah does not love that, and so we don't love that. So if uh, let's say let's say somebody did something nice to somebody else, and I see them being treated uh, poorly, I'll be incensed. I'll be uh, so. Um, but I don't, I feel the same way when it happens to me. If I did something good for someone, my intention was just to be a, a, a good person because that's what Allah loves. But then mm -hmm. if they act like it's a, give me a, like an emotional slap in the face. Um, I, I, I feel like why isn't this person being grateful? And then I worry about, am I mm -hmm. sincere? Yeah. So. Remember, your feelings are valid. You are hurt, you're angry, you're disappointed. Your feelings are valid. What matters is what you do. So next time you have an opportunity to benefit this person, to be nice to them, what are you going to do? Are you going to tell yourself, well, last time I saw them, they weren't nice to me, even though I was so good to them before. So I'm just going to completely ignore them or I'm going to be mean to them. That is a problem, all right? Uh, it's, it's not about not feeling hurt or not feeling disappointed. We, we feel different things. It's about what we do. So you do good to even those who hurt you. Why? So that they make you happy? No, because you're seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason why we've been told to maintain ties of kinship, to join ties of kinship, especially with those who cut off from us, who hurt us, right? So the feelings are valid. It's about what you do. If you're doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then keep doing the best that you can. Just like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he continued to spend on his relative who, uh, mislah, who had actually taken part in spreading the slander about Aisha radiallahu anha. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was very hurt. And initially he thought that he would not uh, financially help Mistah at all. But at the request of Allah azza wa jal, right? Because there were verses revealed regarding this, uh, he continued to spend on Mistah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all sincerity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our deeds from us, private and public, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, grant us the ability to be consistent 
in our deeds, seeking only his approval. Allahumma ameen. I don't want to take more of your time. It's already 624. So inshallah, we will conclude over here. Hafsa. I mean, I mean, Jazakum Allah khair, Ustada Taymiya, for that enlightening session. And to everyone who had the courage to share in the chat and to especially jump on the mic as well. It was lovely to hear from you. I know we're just getting to know each other, but I cannot wait to connect with you guys and to continue to know your, to learn your stories and your reflection throughout this blessed month, inshallah. Just a couple of quick reminders before we close off, inshallah. Tomorrow's session, inshallah, for Ramadan 360 is going to be on God consciousness with Sheikh Amara Shukri. And it's going to be same time, same place, 5 p.m. EST, 9 p.m. UK time. Time. It's translated inside your student portal if you're registered for Ramadan 360. So you'll see the accurate time there. And of course, we're really uh, you know grateful for you guys to, to join us with Al Maghrib, the Al Maghrib Institute's Ramadan 360 program. Our goal has always been to make Islam easy and accessible. And this is our goal with Ramadan 360. So make sure that you're joining us in this journey, that you're registered if you haven't already, and you uh, you know join us with your cameras on, your enthusiasm, with your smiles, and continue to be a positive force with other students around you. SubhanAllah, before this session, my fast was getting to me, and I almost forgot for this entire session that I was even fasting. So keep up with us, inshallah. There's some announcement channels I linked up earlier. Uh, please do make sure that you do join them if, so that you don't miss any reminders. Uh, and you'll get those email reminders as well if you're registered so that you don't miss anything. If you have questions that I wasn't able to answer, my apologies. Uh, please do make sure that uh, you send them there on those channels so that we can respond to you guys and make sure that you're nice and comfortable before our following sessions. Uh, and of course, please continue with the daily giving uh, and supporting our amazing sponsors who make this experience possible year after year. And of course, uh, you know, may Allah allow this benefit, this effort to motivate us all to greatness and make us all blessed, accepted and forgiven during this blessed month. We look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Same time, same place for now. Take care. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Stay safe. And assalamu alaikum wa